Well, we know, first need to understand that regulatory institutions are a relatively new form of governance in India. This is something that hasn't historically existed. Uh, we've had regulatory institutions for a decade and a half or so, maybe a little bit longer. And what's interesting is that they're spreading very, very uh, rapidly through a lot of different sectors. So in the past, we've had regulatory institutions in uh, the finance sector, institutions like SEBI. Uh, but increasingly, we're seeing regulatory institutions used for infrastructure, like telecoms, water, power. Now it's being talked about for environment, for coal, and so on. And I think the important thing to appreciate is um, that there's not a great deal of understanding about what the role of these institutions is and what role they actually play in our governance. And that's what I want to sort of expand on uh, just, a, just a little bit. Now, the idea of regulatory institutions comes out of Europe and before that out of the US, uh, where it was sort of factored into the form of governance that they have there. In India, we imported regulatory institutions as a solution to a very particular problem, which is a perception that a lot of decision making was being captured or taken over by the political process. So the question really becomes, how do you separate out uh, those um, uh, decision making from direct control by the political process where it can be separated out? And this is a, a key distinction. So the idea of independent regulatory institutions uh, comes from the perception that governance would be enhanced by having in an area of governance that is distinct from the political process. So independent from the political process, which of course leads to all kinds of interesting questions about accountability. If it's going to be independent from the political process, how then is it also going to be uh, accountable? Um, now, the, the idea behind it theoretically and in other countries is that there are a limited subset of decisions that should be independent from the government process because, or from the political process rather, because they depend on technical uh, issues and techno-economic issues. So for example, setting the price of electricity, setting the price of, of water, setting the price of coal, uh, monitoring licenses to uh, infrastructure agencies. These things, the argument uh, goes, should be uh, these decisions should be made on techno-economic grounds. They should not be politicized, right? So that's kind of the thinking. If you take out these decisions and put them in a different kind of uh, body, a different agency other than ministries, then those decisions can be made very carefully, very credibly on techno-economic grounds. Now the problem with that is this, that in practice, separating out the political content of decisions from the techno-economic content of decisions is just not so easy the two end up being very closely interrelated. So let me give you an example. If you're setting electricity prices, for example, and a public or a private utility that produces electricity uh, comes to whichever body is setting the prices and saying, listen, we're going at a loss. We need you to raise tariffs if we're going to uh, be financially viable. Well, the regulator or the executive making the decision, -making, making the decision on tariffs might say, well, just a minute. Uh, we don't find that the quality of service has improved so much. People aren't getting electricity, as happens in India all the time. People have to face a lot of blackouts. How then do you raise tariffs and not uh, uh, stimulate a backlash from consumers? Right? So consumers might say, wait a minute, we don't see the results of, of any improvements. Why on earth should we uh, accept price increases? So a supposedly independent regulator could say, listen, we're just doing the numbers based, based on the numbers we should be raising prices. But no regulator, independent or otherwise, in practice in India, is able to raise prices if consumers don't see uh, some gains. So the politics and the techno-economics get closely uh, actually uh, tied together uh, in practice. So this idea that you can cleanly remove political interference, separate the techno-economic content from the political content, in practice uh, hasn't really worked uh, uh, quite as people thought it would. So what you see is regulatory agencies having to actually play a role of uh, reading the political tea leaves and, and balance that against what their techno-economic uh, analysis would show. Uh, and also, you have back-channel communications between uh, the executive and between the regulators, where they're sort of balancing these considerations. Uh, and, and, and so the, the end process is actually, in some ways, a new institution but a new institution that also ends up having to internalize, to some extent, uh, political considerations. Now, what does all of this mean for accountability, which I think is, is, is sort of central to, to try and understand? Um, one of the 
innovations of independent regulatory agencies is that they provide relatively direct forms of accountability as opposed to accountability through the vote process. So the political process provides direct political accountability through the vote. Every few years, a government gets voted uh, in or voted out based on its performance. But it's a blunt form of accountability. So in the case of, a, say, a Delhi state uh, uh, election, is the voter ba voting based on perceptions of corruption, supply of basic services like electricity and water, the quality of the roads, uh, the quality of uh, air, um, uh, the supply of the public distribution system, they're actually voting on all of those things. How do you actually separate out performance? One of the advantages of the regulatory system is that you can have, uh, you can actually observe how well particular sectors are doing. But you can't uh, exercise a vote based on it. You can't vote regulators in or out. So instead what you have are direct forms of accountability, as I said, through procedures and processes. So you have a lot of transparency built into regulatory statutes. You have public hearings. You have a requirement that the regulator provide a reasoned order. So the order has to state explicitly uh, why the regulator is making the decision that he or she is making. And then you have access to redress. We say, well, look, here's what the regulator is supposed to do, but they haven't done it. Based on my understanding of, based on my scrutiny of the regulatory documents, which is facilitated by transparency, by my participation in hearings, and by my reading of the reasoning that the regulator has given. So it provides a different route for civil society in particular, but also for industry, to actually scrutinize the basis for decision making and exercise voice. So it's not vote-based accountability, but it is voice-based accountability. Right? So it is, a, it is a different process. Now that process will only work well if you have capacity to use those mechanisms. You have to have the capacity to scrutinize what are quite complex orders, the time to go to those hearings, the time to follow up, and so on and so forth. In practice, you've seen in some cases, say in electricity or in telecom, citizens groups have used that, those mechanisms, sometimes to good effect. It depends on what state you're in, where you have state level regulators. You might have better capacity in certain states than in other states. So it's a, a mixed bag and, and, and a mixed uh, blessing uh, in, in many ways. It also depends, accountability also depends on very clear upfront guidance when the regulator is being set up. So if you say, if you try and pretend that none of the regulatory decisions have political content, I think you're in trouble. But if you say, listen, they will have political content, but it's up to the political system to give very clear guidance. So suppose the political system says regulators have to make their decisions based on a prioritization of, say, distributional consequences, followed by a prioritization on, of efficiency, followed by other prioritizations. Then it gives the regulator a clear hierarchy of what objectives they should be regulating towards. In the absence of that clear hierarchy, the regulator is going to be just as confused as the political system is in deciding, determining between those. Now in practice, we haven't done a very good job of giving regulators clear signals. Because doing so would be exposing the political system uh, to pushback, saying why this priority and why, why not that one. In other words, it doesn't allow them to, uh, uh, to present a confused picture. There has to be a clear allocation, which, which has political costs. A clear allocation of priority, which has political costs. So in practice, we end up with a situation where politicians don't signal very clearly what they want, what objectives they want regulation to achieve, as a result of which the regulators shuffle around among those regulations, uh, among those objectives, and accountability mechanisms are also imperfect. So at the end of the day, what we see is that regulatory bodies have the potential to provide a new form of accountability through this direct accountability, but in practice, it doesn't work so well because you don't get the clear guidelines from the political system, and you often don't have the capacity to use the procedures that are created to hold regulators to account.